Welcome to Cheddar News. Today is Tuesday, April 16th. I'm in Adoba. Cheddar News is your source for right now. And here's a look at our top stories. The fire is now out, but the shock and the heartbreak of the devastating fire at Notre Dame in Paris is only just beginning. We all watched as the iconic 12th century church in the middle of Paris went up in flames. It took firefighters hours to finally douse those flames, but not before tremendous damage was done, including to Notre Dame's iconic spire, which came crashing down. At this point, many thought this was it. Even the fire chief thought the building would be a complete loss. But last night, a shred of good news. No one died in the fire and only one firefighter was hurt. The main structure of the cathedral was saved and although the spire and roof were lost, the famous bell towers survived. Fire crews were able to save the famed organ inside the cathedral as well. Authorities have ruled out arson or terror as a cause. They say some sort of accident during a massive restoration project is likely to blame. The destruction was difficult to watch, especially during Holy week. The hashtag Notre Dame is one of the top trending on Twitter with millions weighing in on the tragedy. Many recalling their last trips to the cathedral. Cardinal Timothy Dolan, who leads the largest archdiocese in the U.S., offered his prayers. For the French, my God, for the world, Notre Dame uh, Cathedral represents what's, what's, what's most noble, what's most uplifting, uh, what's most inspirational about the human project. And to see that reduced to ashes, my oh my, I, I remember our song from the ashes, uh, We Rise Up. We had Ash Wednesday, we want to rise up with Jesus at Easter, and I believe that there'll be some rising from this dying. Today, French President Emmanuel Macron vowed to rebuild the iconic church. We will continue to follow all of the developments out of Paris right here on Cheddar News. Democrats in Congress are gearing up for a fight over the release of the redacted version of the Mueller report. The Justice Department announced yesterday it will deliver the report to Congress on Thursday. The Attorney General, Deputy Attorney General, as well as the Special Prosecutor all worked on the sections that needed to be blackened out. Democrats say they need to see the entire unedited report to be able to know for sure if the president violated any laws. In the summary given to Congress, the Attorney General stated there was no collusion with Russia, but did not exonerate the president of possible obstruction of justice. The president fired back at the report yesterday, tweeting, The Mueller report, which was written by 18 angry Democrats who also happened to be Trump haters and Clinton supporters, should have focused on the people who spied on my 2016 campaign and others who fabricated the whole Russia hoax. That is, never forget the crime. Bill Weld is officially in the 2020 presidential race as a Republican. America has a choice. New Hampshire, 2019. A better America starts here. Bill Weld for president. The former Massachusetts governor declared his long-shot Republican primary bid yesterday. Welt is focusing on his record as an attorney and governor, defying the odds in a blue state. He also targeted President Trump. Last month, Cheddar's Kristen Scholler spoke with Weld at South by Southwest. We can't go on pretending that the president is normal. He's not. He's not just an untraditional uh, office holder. He doesn't have uh, the skill sets or the character or the temperament to be president of the United States. He's borderline unhinged and we can't afford to have that in the White House. There's no predictability. Other countries think that we've cut loose from our moorings. They don't know what to expect next. That's no way to run a railroad, much less a country. Weld begins his campaign in New Hampshire today. The Pulitzer Prizes were awarded Monday to a wide range of journalists, authors and artists who have excelled in various forms of storytelling. Three local newspapers were awarded the Pulitzer for their coverage of mass shootings. The Capital Gazette in Annapolis, Maryland won a Pulitzer for its coverage of a mass shooting that happened in its own newsroom. Staff quietly embraced each other in the memory of five colleagues that were killed in that incident. The Pittsburgh Post-Gazette won a special breaking news Pulitzer 
Spencer for its coverage of last October's mass shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh that left 11 people dead. The South Florida Sun Sentinel won a Pulitzer for its reporting on the mass shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland. They received the Public Service Award for exposing failings by school and law enforcement officials. The Wall Street Journal won a national reporting prize for uncovering President Trump's secret payoff to former mistresses. While the New York Times won for reporting on President Trump's finances and his refusal to release his tax returns. He did not win the Boston Marathon, but a Marine succeeded in paying tribute to three of his fallen brothers. This was a moment that went viral. Mika Herndon crossed the finish line on his hands and knees. He said he ran the race in honor of three fellow Marines who were killed in action. He even had the names of Mark Juarez, Matthew Ballard, and Rupert Hamer on his running shoes. Herndon says anytime he feels like giving up, seeing their names gives him strength. When he collapsed as he approached the finish line, he says he was going to finish the race one way or another. As soon as he crossed the finish line, paramedics rushed to make sure he was okay. He said as bad as he felt, his fallen comrades and their families went through much worse. After months of debate over presidential candidate Bernie Sanders' tax returns, we finally got a good look at him. Our J.D. Durkin joins us live from the White House. Good morning, J.D. So what do we know about these tax returns? Uh, well, we know that the Vermont senator released about 10 years' worth of financial information, and as he has promised us in recent weeks, he is, in fact, uh, a millionaire. Here's basically how his 2018 filings break down. He and his wife, uh, Jane Sanders, earning uh, just north of $500,000, about 550 cool. or so. That includes the senator's congressional salary, plus that. about an additional $400,000 from a best-selling book. This leads to an effective tax rate of 26%. So the irony here is to say Bernie Sanders has largely devoted much of his time in Congress to railing against a system that allows uh, indiscriminate benefits to flow to the millionaires and billionaires. And now he, too, himself is a millionaire. But I would argue here, Hannah, that the real more uh, impressive financial figure when you talk about Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont is not what's inside his tax returns. It is his strong showing for fundraising here in uh, 2020. Q1 here of 2019, more than $18 million that he brought in, plus in a, 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 for a total amount of more than $28 million he had in the bank because some of that rolled over from the 2016 campaign. Average dollar donation through the first three months here of 2019 at only $20.00. If you remember, back in February, we spoke with former Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley. He was one of the very few Democratic challengers to Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton back in 2016. Uh, and I asked Martin O'Malley directly, what does fundraising like this do, having been there yourself? When you bring in all these dollars, what does the money go towards the infrastructure, the hiring, the staffing? Here's what the former governor of Maryland told us about what this does for a candidacy. In order to compete effectively in those early round of states, yeah. uh, one needs to raise at least ten million dollars mm. to be, you know, really to be in the. And these are ad buys, commercial infrastructure. What does that go sure, to for viewers who may a not a lot really of staff know. Okay. in those early states. It's very high touch and uh, yeah, sure. And buying ad commercials, buying Facebook ads, or, or doing other things on mm. on social media and communications and and everything that goes with a successful campaign. So uh, I think there'll be a number of candidates, not just Senator Sanders this time. So it's a pretty amazing and pretty rare uh, ability to speak with a former presidential candidate like Martin O'Malley and hear it directly from him to say, look, easily said and done, you need $10 million if you're going to be in this game for a long time. So when you look at Bernie Sanders' numbers, kind of suggest to us the Vermont senator, the self-described Democratic Socialist, he's going to be here for quite a while. As for fundraising on the other side of the aisle, those numbers may be impressive, but they're nowhere near as impressive as what the guy who lives here at this house <laughs> over my shoulder brought in more than $30 million for Donald Trump in addition to an additional $46 million that the RNC has already raised. The president's playing by a different set of rules, though. They're going forward with super PACs. they got outside donors, the GOP apparatus, a remarkably aggressive 2020 re-election bid for Donald Trump. Donald Trump brought in more money than Bernie Sanders and Kamala Harris did in Q1 of 2019. Those are the highest uh, fundraisers for the Democratic Party. So for all the talk we're doing on the Democratic side of the aisle, the money, the fundraising, the infrastructure, how long it's going to keep them in the game for, the president and the 2020 re election bid uh, are certainly not taking this challenge lightly, and they insist also on competing when it matters, some would say most, which is fundraising dollars to stay in the race, Hannah. 
And J.D., back to Senator Sanders, he got a little combative over at the Fox News town hall. What did he have to say? That's pretty amazing. You may not think that Bernie Sanders doing an event on Fox News would really matter very much, but it actually rather worked out, a lot of people say, in favor of the Vermont Senator last night. He was there with Brett Baer and Martha McCallum in the community of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and things early in the night took a turn when he defended his newly found millionaire status. Here's the senator. It came from a book that I wrote. Pretty good book. You might want to read it. It was a bestseller. It sold all over the world, and we made money. So if anyone thinks that I should apologize for writing a best-selling book, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it. Unapologetic for his newfound millionaire status there. Now, the other big issue that, of course, the senator is looking to prioritize and talk a lot about is a single-payer or a Medicare-for-all health care system. It's not clear if this kind of backfired on the Fox News host, but at one point, Brett Baer did try and uh, socially poll the audience to see who would be in support of this. I don't know if Fox News necessarily thought that the polling would work this way, but the senator found himself in pretty friendly terrain as soon as the question was asked. Take a look. I want to ask the audience a question, if you could raise your hand here. A show of hands of how many people get their insurance from work, private insurance, right now. How many get it from private insurance? Okay. Now, of those, how many are willing to transition to what the senator says, a government-run system? It was really a, a very friendly room with regards to how the senator goes as the event wore on. Again, it was a pretty amazing event. Members of the audience would even boo specific questions that Martha McCallum and Brett Baer were asking because they aligned more and more with a lot of things that the senator says. And at the end of the day, it works to the advantage of any Democratic challenger here for 2020, whether it's Bernie Sanders or Eric Swalwell or any of the other of them to be able and willing to go on Fox News airwaves and to make their case. A lot of these undecided industrial Midwest voters watch Fox News as their primary source of, of kind of cable news gathering, and they want to hear messaging that's different than just the president. And so that's certainly what we uh, saw the senator try and do last night, Hannah. It was somewhat refreshing and certainly not a response Brett Baer expected. You can tell from the expression on his face, J.D. Thanks so much, yeah. J.D. Dirk, and live at the White House. We'll see you in half an hour. Next on Jutter News, a preview of the opening bell on Wall Street. Plus, AT&T and Hulu are parting ways. We look at what this could mean for the future of streaming. And Delta is looking for ways to protect your personal space on your next flight. We look at how. This is Jutter News, your source for right now. And if you're looking to start your day with all the need news you need to know, sign up for our daily Need to Know podcast. We'll cover the best stories from our newsletter and then some, all delivered straight to your phones every weekday morning. Subscribe at the Apple Store, Google Play, Pandora, Spotify, or Stitcher.